Hey guys, we're doing Genesis chapter 24 today, <clears throat> and I wanted to kind of try to do two lessons today. So we just did uh, Genesis 23, and today, or right now, we're going to do Genesis 24. So let's just jump right in. Starting in verse 1, the Bible reads, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. This was such a, a weird way of making a, um, uh, striking a deal. And uh, you kind of see like the Indians used to like, when they'd strike a deal, they'd kind of lock arms like this. Um, but these guys just had a hand under the thigh, which is, I don't know where that came from and why they do that, but that was how they kind of made a covenant and, and or, or one would swear to another. And he said, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So don't take it from here. Now you know that Abraham is sojourning in the land of Canaan which one day he'll possess, but right now it's the land of his enemies, the end, land of all the Gentiles and all the ites. And he doesn't want to bring his son out of there because remember, you want to keep that people, that the, the people of Israel together, and you don't want them to assimilate with other cultures and take on their religions and you know create the same kind of debacle they had in Genesis chapter 6 where there was all kinds of minglings of believers and unbelievers. So he wants that lineage and that line to remain pure. So he sends him back to the land where he grew up, back to the land of his household. And he wants his servant to go take a wife for Isaac out of there. He doesn't want Isaac to go back there. He wants this servant to go get the wife and then bring him or bring her back to the land of Canaan to give to his son to wife. But thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to go with me to this land. Must I needs bring thy son again to the land from whence thou comest? So what if she doesn't want to come back with me? You know, that's a great question. Uh, that's the, probably the one I would ask. And, and he's saying that in this case, do I need to come back, get your son and bring him back to the land where he came so she he can she can see this husband i mean think of this strange guy going back to your land and saying hey will you come with me it's not even for me but it's to marry my master's son uh if i were the girl and if i were the parents i'd be a little skeptical about sending that girl but if it's of the lord then god could make a way look at verse six and abraham said unto him beware that thou bring not my son thither again do not take him back there the lord god of heaven which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed I will give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. You know, it's very interesting. We just went through this series at our, at our church in Sunday school about angels, but angels, they serve their purpose. I think they, they don't get talked about enough, but I don't even think there would be anything wrong with when we pray for something, for, to ask God, God, would you send one of your angels to go before me and pave the way, maybe soften the heart of somebody or, you know, um, speak to somebody in advance so that by the time they get there and they hear my words, that'll click and they'll know that this is of God. I see no reason. God has messengers and he has angels that the Bible talks about the, um, you know, even children, the face of the earth, their, the angel, uh, their angels are ever before me and, you know, angels keeping children and angels watching over man and angels doing God's bidding for man. There's many verses in the Bible where they're utilized. And I don't think it would be out of the question or weird at all to pray that God would use his angels to go and prepare the way before him. Uh, and such, such is the case of this. He says, he'll send his angel before thee and thou shalt take a wife unto thy son from thence. So, the way is going to be paved before you. He was trusting God that because God had promised that he was going to make a way to have his son Isaac have one of his own people back from his own, uh, his own land. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou art clear from my oath. 
only bring not my son thither again. So Abraham, I think, never even thought that that was going to be a thing because he was trusting God that this would happen. I mean, he just saw God intervene on behalf of sacrificing his own son Isaac. So I think God was fully capable and Abraham is trusting him at this point to find him a wife to fulfill that promise of making them, um, uh, making his son uh, the first of a uh, of many nations that his seed would be eternal and um, it would be as the sand of the sea and as the stars in the sky. So it says, verse nine, and the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. And the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of even, even the time that women go out to draw water. So I think of that woman at the well in Samaria, it was probably even time when Jesus went because that was the time at even uh, uh, as the sun was going down where women would come out to draw uh, um, water. <clears throat> and he said, so he, he kind of was in the place. He said, hey, if I need to find a woman, I need to go to where the women are at. And this is when the woman women come out and it wouldn't be weird for them to be um, in the middle of this town talking to another man. So he was in the right place at the right time in front of the right group of people to be able to fulfill his mission. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. So he prays before he goes out. And we're going to look at some things about the will of God in a second, but some of you are maybe thinking, well, I need to find the will of God in my life. I know that God has something special for me. Maybe you're looking for a spouse. Maybe you're looking for a job or a new, a new church, or you're praying for something specific. What is God going to have me to do in life? What does he even want? Maybe you're a young person and have no clue what God wants you to, him to do with your life. It'd be a good idea to go before and pray before you're about to set out to you maybe uh, find a spouse or to uh, find uh, what it is you're supposed to be doing to pray before that and to have God send you good speed. Um, it means well or a prosperous journey. Behold, I stand here at the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down the pitcher, I pray thee, and that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thee thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. Thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness to my master. And I know, guys, you know, we always say the letting out of the fleece. If you want this, then let this happen. I don't necessarily see any wrong with asking that even in today's day and age. But the, the servant of Abraham said, if this is the right woman, if this is who you want sent, let this happen. She'll say, not only will I give you drink, but I'll give drink for your camels also. And, and just put God, I think sometimes our faith is so shallow that we just don't think God can fulfill things. Now, I think at the same time, people put some, some ridiculous stipulations on God. God will only do this if this exact thing happens, and it's the most far-fetched thing. Because when we want to do something, we put this crazy attachment to it. But if we're earnestly, if our heart's in the right place and we're earnestly seeking God, I don't think there's anything wrong with God with asking on God, if you want this happen, would you go ahead and let this happen? He's fully capable of doing that. You know, I've told atheists before, if, if you're trying to say if God is real, why don't you just, because, you know, they're not reading the word of God. They're not, you know, I told them to just ask about things in, in creation. You know, let this happen. And you you ask God and put him on the spot. In the book of Malachi, it says, prove me now therewith. And so I there's nothing wrong with you proving God and saying, God, if you're real, please show yourself to me. You know, like, uh, you know, manifest yourself in this way. You know, and I, I believe that I serve a God who's fully capable of revealing himself to an atheist. And so that's just me. I might be wrong, but that, that's me. And it came to pass, therefore, he had done speaking that behold, so he's done praying, Rebekah comes out, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. So same family line right here with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, 
neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. So this sounds like the right girl, right time, right place. She's pretty. Uh, checking all the boxes here. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a, a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, so here's the test. He's, he's waiting to see if she's going to respond with the same thing he asked prayer for. Drink, my Lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So he's still kind of skeptical here. He's like, man, she did everything I just asked the Lord to, to have her say. But he needs, he needs to see if this is, you know, of God. And it came to pass, we got, we got to see the big question right here. He's going to pop the question and see her reaction. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of a half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She, she said, moreover unto him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be, and this is kind of the theme verse I want to take for this chapter. Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. I being in the way, the Lord led me. So two things to answer this question that maybe is the most asked question by Christians. What is the will of God for me? Or how do I find the will of God? Is there a specific roadmap? Is there specific instructions that will show me how to find the will of God? And we make it into this great complex mystery that we just kind of like, we just try all these tactics and just one day like this, just it's just going to hit us. You know, you hear about these people being called to preach or called to the mission field. And we think the will of God's kind of like that, that one day we just break down crying uncontrollably and, and God has just revealed to me beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know, I may as well heard the audible voice of God. He said, this is the will, you know, from my, and, and that's not always how it works. Uh, and there's a way simpler formula than you think on how to find the will of God. Well, step one is found right here in this verse. I, being in the way, the Lord led me. Now, Abraham's servant had a specific thing to do. He was trying to find the will of God for his master, uh, Isaac, to bring him a wife. Okay, His one goal, his one mission is to find the will of God for Isaac. So when he goes, number one, he prays, God, show it to me. Show it to me specifically. Number two, he thank, when, he, when she does say, absolutely, she says all the right things, she checks all the right boxes, he said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. Tell me, could the Lord have led him if he wasn't in the way? Meaning if he went a different way, if he did not go to the town where he grew up, if he did not go to that right land, and he said, well, this looks like there's a whole lot more women out there by this well over on this in this city. It's not where Abraham sent me, but I think he'll find the right wife here. Would that same thing have happened for the servant of Abraham if he didn't do what he was supposed to do? If he didn't obey direct orders, if he didn't um, uh, do the task that was assigned him, would the Lord have led him? The Bible says, um, uh, uh, I just forgot the verse, I just blanked out. Trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy might and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways, in all thy ways, the ways you already go, acknowledge him, put him first, make him go before you 
and he shall direct thy paths. You want to get in the right way? Then in the way you're already going, what you do in your day-to-day -day living, put God first and get in the way. If you're in some other way, if you're living like the world, if you've got friends of the world and you go places of the world and you do all the things the world, you're in the wrong way to begin with asking for the way of God. So you get in the way you're supposed to go and God will direct your paths. And he thanked God. He said, I being in the way the Lord led me. So number one, you want to find the will of God um, is get in the way. That's the first thing. Do what you're already supposed to be doing. And the second thing is you don't find the will of God to begin with. The will of God finds you. Let me give you some examples. Saul was not setting himself up to be king. He had no clue that he would be the man that God wanted him for the task to be the first king of Israel. He was shepherding and just doing the normal mundane things of life, putting God first, getting in the way, and the will of God found him. Samuel said, thou art the man. You're like he, he selected him and God impressed upon him. That's going to be the king of Israel. The other thing is David. David was shepherding. He killed a lion. He killed a bear. He was just delivering cheese and, and different uh, uh, provisions for his brothers at the battle, doing what he was supposed to do, just being a servant of God. And God had him fight Goliath, and you know the whole story from there, and God set him up to be king of Israel. Moses. Moses was a man who couldn't speak right. He, he was... Um, you know, maybe even some, I don't know what his, his speech thing was, but he was, he was not a very gifted speaker, not a very uh, proficient leader. There was other men way more capable of Moses, yet the will of God for Moses's life was to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. And God chose the humble and the abased things of this world, like Moses, over the people that would have been more qualified to be the leader. But Moses was already just doing, he was an Egyptian, he was in the house of Pharaoh, he saw one of his um, his brethren, another Hebrew at the time, didn't even know it, uh, being persecuted, and he kills the Egyptian, and he's just doing the right thing. And out of that, God selects him to be the leader of Israel. So my advice to you is stop looking for the will of God and just look to be in God's will every day. Look at this while I'm talking, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Stop trying to find this writing in the sky. You know, the whole universe has to align. Looking for a bunch of tears and some sort of overwhelming, swelling feeling where God just reveals this vision to you on what you're supposed to do. And maybe if you're supposed to be a doctor, all of a sudden he flashes the medical sign in front of you. Stop looking for this pie in the sky type of um, will of God and just do the everyday will of God and get in the way and God will reveal himself to you. Look at this. If you want some basic, just this is the will of God verses, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse 3. For this is the will of God. Here you go. Even your sanctification, right? You want to be sanctified, set apart for the master's use. You want to get in the way. Try this one on for size, that you should abstain from fornication. Young people, you want the will of God for your life. You want to find a man of God. Who's it going to be? God, put lightning bolts over his head. Let me know if this is God's man for you. How about you just do this? This is the will of God for you right now. Not to go find the lightning bolts, but just to abstain from fornication. Stop sleeping around. Or, or if you haven't even started yet, don't start sleeping around. You be different than the world. Sanctification, set apart. This is your sanctification that you abstain from fornication. Why? Because God purchased you. He purchased your body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with the price. Wherefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So they don't belong to you. You don't just do whatever you want, whatever your fleshly desires are. And I know it's hard, and I know it's not popular in this world, but this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. So number one, that's, that's something you can do. Look at another thing you could do that is the clear will of God. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verse 18, says this. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You say, well, that's not really what I wanted to hear. I'm trying to find out what I want to do in life. Well, before you can find out that, 
This is the will of God right now, that in everything you do, you look at the positive and you give thanks for it. My circumstance right now, you know how easy it is for me to be like when people say, how are you doing? I'm like, well, it stinks. Like I hate sitting here at home and I do. But you know what the will of God for my life in this current circumstance is? To give thanks for my knee being injured, to give thanks for the time to just sit here and do some devotionals for the two hour talk of um, theology I had with my daughter the other day. Uh, talking about the deeper things of life, for the ability to slow down where I wouldn't have given myself that own that that time and that space to just kind of sit and think and relax because I'm a go, go, go. And sometimes we could do that so much, we stress ourselves out and it's maybe bad for our health. It's bad for our relationships. It's bad for our mental state. So God had to put me here on my back to kind of just stop let other people handle things, maybe not micromanage everybody so much and be on top of everybody else. Maybe the only way that other people in my business could thrive and rise to the top as managers and as shift leaders was for me not to be there. And God knew that. And maybe he had to make a way for me to just sit and rest. The Bible says in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God. So the will of God, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, because the Bible tells me it is for my life right now, is to be giving thanks and to find every little bit of gratitude. I had an unsafe person tell me this. He said, while you're resting, while you're healing, find, find gratitude in all the little things in life. This is from an unsafe person. You know what he was saying? He'd say, hey, you know what the will of God is? He didn't know he was saying this because he's not a Christian. He said, but in everything you do and in everything you find on a day-to-day, -day, even the most mundane things, right now I have this nice warm, blanket on me. I could be freezing or I could be outside with the gnats. I could be, somebody could be coming to repossess my house because I don't have the money to pay for it. In all the little things, I should sit here and say, Lord, thank you for this warm blanket. Thank you for this air conditioned house. Thank you for the pizza place, maybe making up for what I can't do at the salon, but now it's paying my bills so that nobody comes and takes away what we've provided for the, the family. In all these little things, I could sit here and meditate on things, and that's what we're going to look at next is meditation. And I can give thanks in all things, and I would be 100% in the will of God. Now, I could choose to not be in the will of God and sit here and grumble and complain and murmur and all the different things I could do, and I could make justification for it, and I could throw myself a pity party, and I could say, well, you're not in this position. You don't know. And I could snap at people and take it out on my family when they get home because I'd rather be working or I'd rather be doing things. Or I could sit here and almost think myself happy at all the things around me God's blessed me with. So you want to be in the will of God? Number one, you don't find the will of God. The will of God finds you. Number two, do like the servant of Abraham and get in the way. Do the things you're supposed to do so that God will trust you. With the, if you want God to trust you with the big thing in life, then do the little mundane things in life the right way, and God will trust you with the big, the big things, and that will of God will find you. All right, let's go back to uh, Genesis, back to our, our chapter here. Genesis chapter 23, 24, sorry. Mm, I forgot. I'd be in the way the Lord led me. Uh, the damsel ran, verse 28, and told them of her mother's house. Thought I heard a, a clicking, sorry. And told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out to the man and to the well. And it came to pass when he saw the earring and bracelet upon his sister's hands. And when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. That Laban character is going to be an influential character, so remember that name. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. And they were just ready to receive this guy. What a, what a nice welcome he got. Uh, and, you know, sometimes God gives you little things like that when you're kind of wondering, is this right? Is this of God? And God just gives you a peace and puts like the best people into your life. And, you know, they just receive you with just open arms and so welcoming. And that's kind of another confirmation that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And the man came to the house and he ungirded his camels and gave straw and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. 
I was wondering if men, there was other guys with him because it says he took 10 camels. 10 camels on a journey like that with all this stuff and treasures and everything to give to these people is a lot for one guy to handle, but it looks like the servant brought men with them. And uh, there was meat before them to eat. And he said, I will not eat until I've told mine errand. And he said, speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant, who a man they were well familiar with because he's family. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and manservants and maidservants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when he was old, and to him that he and to uh, him he hath given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt take a wife to thy son of the daughters of the Canaanites, and whom thou shalt not take a, a wife. Uh, the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go to my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, peradventure, the woman will not follow me. And he said unto, uh, he said unto me, the Lord before whom I will walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Then shalt thou hear, then shalt thou be clear from this oath when thou comest to my kindred. And if they will give not thee one unto uh, uh, thou shalt be clear from my oath. And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, it now, uh, it now thou do prosper my way, which I shall go. Behold, I stand, I stand by the well of water and shall come to pass when the virgin cometh to draw water. And I'll say unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she shall say, he's just recapping this whole thing. That's why I'm not kind of stopping because you've already heard this in the beginning part of the chapter. Both drink thou and I will also draw for thy camels the same, the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in mine heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder and she went down to the well and drew water. And I said unto her, uh, let me drink, I pray thee. And she made me haste, let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll give you cam camels drink also. And I drank, so she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and said, whose daughter art thou? She said, the daughters of Nahor's son, whom Milka bare unto him. And I put the earring on her face and the bracelets on her hands. And I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter to his son. Master's brother's daughter to his son. And now, if ye will deal kindly and truly with thy master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to, not, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. You know, tell me if I should be going somewhere else. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Say, this thing's coming from God. I ain't touching that with a 10-foot pole. You do what God has you do. Smart people. Behold, Rebecca is before thee. Take her and go. And let her be thy master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. I tell you what, for those of you who are trying to find a wife um, and you're so worried about talking to the dad, if you're doing the right thing and you're treating her with respect and everything, that dad's already praying for the right person if he's a godly man anyways, which you should be looking for a godly family. A, a girl who has a godly dad because you want to have that instilled in that girl before you get her. So that if it's a godly father raising a godly girl, she'll know what kind of man she should be looking for. And if you're, if that's the kind of thing you're looking for, um, that, that God, God's already going to prepare his heart to give him peace about you. So you don't need to try to dazzle him and show off and do all these things to try to win him over. You be yourself, you be respectful. And if this is the right thing, not only will you and the girl click and vice versa and the families, uh, you know, it'll be well with the families, but God will speak to that father and let him know if he's a godly man and he wants the will of God for his daughter, that you're the right one. So you let God take care of that, just like he did in this story. It's a good lesson to be learned. Uh, verse 52, and it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And notice he gives thanks immediately when God answers prayer. We're so quick to pray for something 
And then when God answers it, we carry about on our daily lives, forgetting to show gratitude and thanks for the prayer he just answered. My advice to be was do it immediately. Thank God right then and there when God answers prayer. You don't want to ever forget to give thanks. Or maybe uh, he'll just say, you know what? You never gave thanks for the last 10 things that I answered prayer for. Maybe I'll just stand back a while until you learn to have some gratitude. Uh, and he brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave to Rebecca and gave also to her brother and her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning and said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days. A few is three. <laughs> At least ten. So I, I don't blame them. You know, if, if you're that the girl's family, you'd want to spend some time with the girl before... You know, she goes uh, and says after that, then she, she'll, then she shall go. In verse 56, he said unto them, hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. So he's not waiting. It's, not, it's a now or never thing. And they said, we will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. Let us ask her here from her own mouth. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Brave girl. And they sent away Rebecca their sister and their nurse and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions. Yeah, no doubt. She's going to be the, the, the mother of billions. Imagine the mother of billions. And let thy seed possess the gate of those that hate them. Wow. That's a, that's quite the, uh, that's quite the uh, the blessing there. And by the way, this is the only time the word millions is mentioned in the Bible. This is a very big thing. We're talking about big numbers here. And it's not just millions, it's thousands of millions. So uh, obviously billions, we know. And Rebecca arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebecca and, and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well, Lehario, Leharii, Lehi. Lahai Roi, sounds Chinese. For he dwelt in the south country, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And I want to kind of pause right there, verse 63. We're at 32 minutes in, we're almost finished. And I want to look at a um, some verses on meditation. So it says, Abraham went in the field. When, when they came to him, this is what Abraham was doing when his servant got there. He had gone into the field to meditate at eventide. No doubt the field was a place of quiet. It was a place to get out from the, the regular workday things of life, undistracted, looking at the creation of God and be able to commune with God as friend with friend. Meditation is something that I believe every Christian should do. Sometimes we hear the word meditation and we just leave it to the Hindus. We just leave it to the Buddhists. That's up to those Weirdo, hippie, whatever, to they meditate. Though we Christians, we don't meditate. We read our Bible, we pray. No, they meditated, and uh, and Abraham meditated. And what is that? What is the word meditation? It's to be in deep thought. It's to literally sit there and ponder on thoughts, and not just let them like like trains in our mind just kind of go by. There's that thought. There's that thought. Constantly meditating is is taking is taking time to relax your mind and think on things. Um, let us, let's look, this is the first time it's mentioned. So let's look at the second time it's mentioned, Joshua, Joshua 1, 8, Joshua judges, Joshua 1, 8, chapter one, verse eight. In Joshua chapter one, verse eight, it says the law, the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Hey, do you want to have a successful life? Do you want to have a prosperous life? And I'm not preaching prosperity gospel. I'm not even talking about monetary or riches or anything like that. I'm talking about, do you just want to be successful in life with your family, with your job, with the with the your your body, your health, your your all the things. If you want to do that, meditate on the things God commanded you. Meditate on the book of the law. 
meditate on the things you read in scripture. Don't just read a verse for the day and just let it go in and let it go out. Take time to constantly regurgitate that, rechew it like a cow would rechew the cud, and think on the verses you read. Think, you know, sometimes I'll do these these studies, and then at night, just something I I read or was studying or I'd said on the video. That's why I like doing these videos. A lot of times when you're teaching something to somebody else, you retain it all the more. Think about it even at work. If you've ever had to teach somebody else on your job site something that you already do, doesn't that kind of reinforce it even more for you? If it's something on the computer, it helps you understand that computer more. If it's something you're a factory worker and you have to you know, mess with certain machinery and you have to teach somebody else how to use that machinery, you understand the machinery better. And it's the same for me. And that's one of the biggest reasons I like doing these videos. And, and I know when I'm working and going here and there, it'll be a time thing, but it'll be good for me to teach it because I'll retain the knowledge and understanding of it that much more. And God will be able to bring that back to remembrance for me to meditate on later. So we're commanded to meditate on the book of the law. Uh, so that is what we meditate on. That, As a Christian, that's not the only thing. Sometimes I meditate on things of the family. Sometimes I meditate on things of, of work. And sometimes I meditate trying intentionally to not think of anything at all and to let, I kind of like imagine like that my thought bubbles as they come to mind are like kind of like viewing a highway and I can watch the cars pass by, acknowledge that, yes, indeed, those are cars or yes, indeed, these are my thoughts, but I let them just pass by, choosing not to engage and to think even deeper on them. And it kind of gives me a clarity of mind and allows my mind to kind of decompress. And uh, just like you would, you would give your body rest, it gives your brain rest. So there's different forms of meditation. I recommend all of them really because there's a time and a place but the number one thing a christian should be doing and what we should be meditating meditating on is this book of the law and the statues and the precepts contained therein so that's what we should meditate on let's look at when not to meditate is there a time not to meditate look at the book of luke chapter 21 luke chapter 21 Luke 21, and we're going to look at verse 14. Luke 21, 14, one more page, says this, settle it, settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. So there's a time you should settle in, in your hearts. There's things in this, in this Bible that you should just kind of make up your mind about. And just have it settle in your heart that you don't even have to think on things before. Now, I, let me say this. It's a good idea to meditate before you give answers. It's a good, it's, but there's some things where when it comes to how you're saved, when you've got that in here, settle it in your heart. I don't need to think before giving an answer how to be saved. Or I don't need to think, is God is, the, is Jesus Christ the one true God? I don't even have to think about those things because they're settled in my heart. That's something I don't ever have to meditate on in order to give an answer. Okay, so settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist, and ye shall be betrayed both the parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you that shall be caused to be put to death is speaking of the events of the uh, tribulation. And there's going to be a time where even your own family delivers you up to be persecuted or even to be put to death. And he's saying at that time, those time, you don't need to think on what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit is going to fill your mouth and give you the words that uh, that are so eloquent and so right at the time that there's going to be nobody able to gainsay. There's going to be nobody able, even your adversaries won't be able to resist you. And that's that's refreshing to know that, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He said, don't even worry about it. You don't have to put one second thought to it. I'm going to give you what you need to say at the hour that you need it. So in this case, the time not to meditate is what are you going to do when persecution arises? Don't worry about it. Don't meditate on it. God will give you what you need to do. And then kind of a twofold example of that is things that you've already settled in your heart. 
uh, that the scripture has confirmed to you. God has stamped his approval and the Holy Ghost has sealed you to the day of redemption. I'm not worried about losing my salvation. I'm not worried about how to be saved. I'm not worried about the things that are right and that God has revealed in his word to me because they're settled in my heart. I don't even need to think about those things. So what to meditate on, that's when not to meditate. And then why do we meditate uh, anyways? Then lastly, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter four, look at verse 13 through 16. First Timothy four, 13 through 16. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation and doctrine. I remember I had someone tell me, the Bible never says you're supposed to read, you have to read the Bible. You know, we're always like, read your Bible, read your Bible. The Bible never says that. Actually, yes, it does. It says, when, till I come, till when he comes back and gets us, give attendance to reading. So to give attendance, like that means you should be reading. Now, I don't think he means Harry Potter. I'm pretty sure he, we know what he means by reading, reading the scriptures, to, exer, to exhortation and to doctrine, to teachings. And, you know, and I also wonder about the people that are always like, you know, kind of making fun of learning or, or learning doctrine. Doctrine is something we should be constantly giving attendance to, and it's something we should constantly be looking into. Uh, and and doctrine is important. And you shouldn't make it the paramount thing where the only thing you're ever capable of talking about with people about theology is doctrine. You know, there's other things out there, but it's important and not to be neglected. Uh, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Remember speaking to a young preacher here being ordained. Uh, meditate upon these things. Meditate upon those things, the reading, the exhortation, the doctrine, the gift that's in thee. These are things you should be constantly thinking about. Why do we meditate? Because, uh, what's this next thing? Uh, semicolon. Give thyself wholly to them. Can you give yourself wholly to something that you're not meditating on? Think about that. Sometimes we'll do this so fast, we don't think about what we're saying. In order to give yourself wholly to something, you should be meditating on something that thy profiting may appear to all because you are going to be the best version of yourself to you want you want to let your light shine you want people to recognize that you commune with god then you need to meditate on his precepts you need to settle some things in your heart and you need to give yourself wholly to those things the best way to do that is by meditating take heed to thyself and to the doctrine continue in them for in doing this Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You know, because it's going to make you the best version of yourself and it's going to reflect in other people that see you. That's why. That's going to be, they're, they're going to take notice that you are a whole, complete uh, Christian and having the whole armor of God. So that's why we do it because we want to be uh, the best people, best Christians that we can be. And we don't want to just do it for ourselves. It's not just for the benefit of ourselves, but it's the Bible says to them that hear thee. Okay. If, if, if you want what comes out of your mouth to not be nonsense, make sure you've meditated and you have understanding of those things before we're constantly flapping those gums. Okay. So you want to minister grace to the hearers. Let's go back. Uh, so we looked at what to meditate on, when not to meditate, and why to meditate. And we see that Abraham meditated at even time. And that was my takeaway from this chapter. Let's finish up the chapter here. Um, and this was verse 63 we left off on. Verse 64, And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off her camel. For when... For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. You know, she wanted that first impression to be that. This is, here's some wet, It's wedding time here. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her unto his uh, mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah. And she became his wife. And he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. 
You know, there's not nothing like, you know, I'm sure he's missing his mom. Obviously his mom had died, but there's, there's that sweet, he didn't just get a mother, he got a wife and that comforted him after his mother's death. And this was done right from the beginning. The, the servant obeyed the master. The servant was in the right place, right time. And he said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. The Lord prospered his journey, brought the wife over to Isaac. And this is a happily ever after story. And a lot of times in this, in this life of Abraham, you can see that God worked some things out. But there was shaky stuff that happened. Abraham maybe had to lie, and you know he, you know, didn't quite do things all right all the time. But this this chapter, from beginning to end, everything was done as it should have been done, and it ended with a happy ending. So there's your fairy tale lesson for the day. We'll see you guys next time.